you would just turn, if you have a Bible with you, if not, I'll read as clearly as I can. If you would turn with me, please, to Psalm number 50. Psalm number 50. Really, verse 21, that's on my mind, but I'll maybe just for the sake of it commence at verse number 16. But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do? Sorry, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldst take of my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee, when thou sawest a thief, when thou contendest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers? Thou givest thy mouth, to, thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slandereth thine own mother's son. And this is the verse here I have in mind. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest I was altogether such an one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. God saying there in verse 21, these things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Turn over with me, please, to John chapter 19. God's, God, uh, John's gospel, chapter number 19. It's the story of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ when he died on the cross at Calvary for sin. I want to read just one verse, verse number 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Turn over with me, please, to Revelation chapter number five. In this chapter, we have a revelation that John saw right into heaven. And he saw those of the redeemed people in heaven. In verse number nine, chapter five, verse number nine, and they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels around about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying or singing with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And turn back for one final reading, please, to Matthew's gospel, chapter number 13. Matthew chapter number 13. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the speaker here. He's speaking of the kingdom of heaven. In verse number 47, he says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels and cast the, the bad away. And this is my two verses here, verse 49 and 50. And so shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. We trust that God will bless this, these scattered readings of his word. I read to you in Psalm number 50, these things, God being the speaker, and speaking to the wicked, or speaking to the unsaved, as, as we would call them. He says, these things hast thou done, and I have kept silence. And so from that verse, I want as quickly as I can and as briefly as I can, I want to speak to you about the silence of God in your life. I want then from John 19 just to consider a few moments. And the Savior cried out with a loud voice that is finished on the cross. I want to consider the cry of Christ. The silence of God, the cry of Christ. And then from Revelation Number nine, as John looked into heaven and he saw a redeemed people singing, I want to consider the song of the redeemed. And finally, if we get time, and I'll not want to dwell on it, but Matthew 13, verse 49 and verse number 50, just give us a little insight into the end of the unbeliever. 
And I want to consider not this time the song of the redeemed, but I want to consider very quickly and very briefly the wail of the damned. The silence of God. I have a little bracket of my notes here just beside it. And I just have written in the brackets the cry, the silence of God. And I've written in brackets beside it. It's merciful. Mind you, God is merciful. God is gracious. And as God looks up down upon our meeting tonight, there's those he sees in the meeting who have accepted his son as their savior. But unfortunately, there's those in the meeting tonight and as yet, despite several approaches from God, to date you have rejected God and his salvation. Maybe tonight you're banking on the silence of God. You've got to whatever age you are. And there's been move, no move apparently on God's part. And you think I'm getting away with this. And maybe you think like I thought before I was saved. I used to think, you know, God has other people to deal with. There's other people worse than me. There's other people that refuse to go to meetings. There's other people in deeper sin than me. And God will have them to deal with before he deals with me. And I warn you tonight faithfully, God is no respecter of persons. For the, for the Bible reminds me that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. And the Bible tells us thine iniquities, however few or however many they might be. Isaiah reminds us that our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away from God. And can I tell you tonight, if you're not saved, that tonight as you sit under the sound of my voice, you're further away from God. And you're maybe further away from his salvation than ever you have been. But thank God for a gracious God. Thank God for a God who is rich in mercy. He's not willing that any should perish. He willeth not the death of any. And despite your rejection, and despite you not want anything to do with the gospel or with the Christ of the gospel, he is merciful towards you. And the grace of God, where sin abounded, the verse has just come into my mind, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Where would any one of us be but for the grace of God? The grace of God that touched our lives, those of us who are saved. I don't stand here before you tonight. I don't stand before you one hair better than anyone here. I don't present myself as having done everything right, and here I am to tell you what you need to do. I stand before you nothing more than a sinner saved by grace. I stand before you just a wretched, wicked sinner. But I thank God for the day on the 27th of March 2013 when God came in in matchless grace and he saved my soul. I want to tell you something. The God that saved me is the God that longs to save you. You know, people think that some people think, you know, God is just a, a holy God and so he is, but he's just a God that wants to go about punishing and Dishing out his wrath, I say that reverently. And mind you, God will. Because there is wrath, beware, the Bible says. And there is the wrath of God. The wrath of God lies before you. But I want to tell you again, and I'm sure you know it well. We all live in the day of grace. And God, another time, is giving you an opportunity to be saved. And what would it be if this was your last opportunity? Mind you, God has given you many opportunities. And here you are again under the sound of the gospel. Bally Clare at large rushes madly by. No interest. No interest in the gospel. No interest in God. And here you are highly privileged under the sound of the gospel. Not because I'm preaching, but because the word of God is opened. And someone is just trying to tell you God's way of salvation. But I would pray that there would be a stronger voice tonight than my voice. And oh, that the Spirit of God would move and convict, the, convict, convict men of sin. For mind you, Revelation 21 tells me this, that there shall in no wise enter into heaven anything that defileth. Can I just make it abundantly simple and clear? If you're not saved, you'll never be in heaven. If you're not saved, you'll never be in heaven. 
And my Bible only tells me of one other place. And that's an awful place called hell of which we read in Matthew's gospel. And mind you, I tell you, if you're not saved, that's where you'll end up. And what makes this matter so serious is forever. Never to come back anymore. And that's what could just be around the corner. There's a neighbor, there's a neighbor of my father's, their son. I think if I can remember the story correctly, I think he's 34. They buried him on Monday. He died without any testimony. 34 years old. He took not well, I think, the Friday week before it. He took well, not well over that weekend. He got some medication on the Friday and felt worse over the weekend. On Monday, he took a clot in his lung. And before he had a chance to think, he was out into eternity. A man that had lived a wicked life. A man that had enjoyed the so-called pleasures of sin, and yet in himself, I hear he was trying to change that. He was trying to get away from that that he had been gripped by. Just the devil in control, the soul that sinneth as a servant of sin. Did you ever think, dear soul, tonight, that if you've got to this stage in life and you're not saved, you're just a servant of sin? I used to think, you know, I could do what I wanted. And I used to think I could control it. And I can do that and this and the other. And I'll stop it whenever I, I want to stop it. But I just found that the devil was a little stronger than I was. And I had to discover and realize something that I just couldn't stop it as I thought. Habits I had formed. Things that I enjoyed. And I can remember on one occasion in particular, thinking, right, tonight I'm going to try and not do this. But mind you, I tell you, before the night was out, I was at it just the same as every other night. And maybe it's that way with you. Maybe you think you have some excuse as to why you're not saved and why you don't want the gospel. And you'll look at people there and, well, they did this and they said that. Listen, I want to tell you something. When you stand before the judge of all the earth, it'll no matter who said what. It'll be what think ye of Christ. Think of the words of Pilate. He said, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And that's the choice that lies before you tonight in this meeting. And mind you, the choice is yours. There'll be nobody force you into it. And there'll be nobody here forcing you or talking you into anything. We just want to preach Christ and him crucified as the only savior of sinners. But the choice will entirely be yours. And you will make a choice tonight. You would need to be very careful and make the right choice. Because tomorrow could be eternity just hidden from your view. Just like that 30-year-old, 34-year-old neighbor of my father's. And mind you, if God was to call time tonight or tomorrow, and you made the wrong choice tonight, and the words of the hymn writer would be true of you, sad will their final ending be, lost through a long eternity. As I said earlier, it never ends, you know. That's what makes this serious. Time is short. Tom uh, Armstrong's with us at the minute in Ballymena and Gospel, and he spoke the other night on a little note that he had received from a family member that was written years ago to a fellow who wasn't saved, and the little note just said this, time is short, eternity is sure. Mind you, that's serious if you think about that. Time is short, we don't know how short. Time is short, eternity is sure. If it was the other way around, it wouldn't be so important. If time was sure and eternity was short, well, then maybe we could get away with it. But mind you, time is short. And eternity is sure. And so the silence of God that you have witnessed so far, that silence will come to an end someday. And God in his grace is giving you another opportunity. He's remaining silent with regard to your sin. But you make, you make, sure, you make sure of this and you be well aware of this. He says in that same verse, he says, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. There's a day of judgment coming and you will sit before God someday, either as a sinner in your sins bound for judgment or as a sinner saved by grace bound for glory. And the choice is yours. And I leave my point on the silence of God and on the grace of God. You don't bank on the silence of God forever because there's a day coming when God will reach out in wrath, because there is wrath, beware. 
lest he take thee away with a stroke. Then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. I want to come to John 19. I want to get to Calvary. We read of the cry of Christ. I think it's maybe Luke's gospel, or is it Mark's? Maybe it's Mark's gospel, chapter 15. It says that he cried with a loud voice. What did he cry? When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said it is finished. I want to point you to the cross tonight on Calvary's hill, 2,000 years ago. For there the Lord Jesus Christ was numbered with the transgressors. He who was sinlessly perfect. He who was in himself God. He was the he was the divine revelation of God in a body of flesh. And there he was on Calvary's cross. And God sent him into this world. First John says the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And dear friend, in the meeting tonight, unsaved, if you ever want to be saved, if you ever want to be in heaven, you need the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's nothing else will do. There'll be nothing else in yourself that you can do. But the only reason that I stand before you saved tonight is because Christ died for my sins. He died on the cross. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And with his stripe, I am healed. And listen, I want to tell you tonight, your sins, though they be many, I don't need to know how many. I don't need to know what you've done. I don't care how black it is. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And there on Calvary's cross, Isaiah 53 and verse 6 reminds us of this. God laid on him the iniquity of us all, the substitutionary nature of the death of Christ. That is God's salvation. When God made to meet upon him, when God laid on him, who his own self bear our sins on his own body on the tree, and the judgment and the wrath of God against your sin and against my sin was laid on the person of Christ on the cross. Payment God will not twice demand. The sin of the world was laid upon him. And thank God tonight he rose from the dead, for he lives through the power of an endless life. He had a sinless life. He had no sin. I tell you, if he had, sin, if he had as much as thought a sin, he could never have died for my sin because he would have had to have died for his own. We needed a savior. We needed a substitute who had no sin of his own. And there he went to Calvary's cross in all his glory, in all his perfection. Men rejected him. Men hated him. He spat upon his lovely face. But dear friend, in the meeting tonight, I want to tell you this. It was there that he exhausted at the hand of God the, the, the penalty for the sin of the world and he, on those hours of, on, the, of the, on the cross, when he died there for sin, he exhausted at the hand of God what an unrepentant sinner will never ever exhaust throughout the endless ages of eternity. There's nothing in yourself you can do. You can try to tidy up your life. This man I've told you about, he's 34, he was trying to kick, to kick a sinful habit he had and he couldn't manage it because he's just a guilty sinner. He, he was just a guilty sinner, just a servant of sin, just like someone in the meeting here tonight, just a servant of sin. Mind you, if the truth of that would grasp you, just that you're a servant of sin. and You're not in control of the thing yourself at all. And the devil, you know, he's only making a fool of you. Oh, try the joys that Christ can give. I lived in my sin for 43 years. and the last 10 years, I tell you, it's been a different life. I wouldn't go back for a day. I wouldn't go back for five minutes. I sat with a man yesterday. I used to enjoy the pleasures of sin with him. And he's still at the same old thing, a lovely a gentleman. A gentleman to say the least, but mind you, he's just a sinner. I invited him to a gospel meeting and he won't come. But we leave him with God. But you're here tonight through the grace of God. And God has been silent in your life. And he has as yet not closed his hand upon you. But dear friend, I want to tell you, when the Savior said it is finished, everything was fully done. The price has been paid in full. 
The price to save you has been fully paid, fully met by Christ on the cross. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Why? That he might bring us to God. He has once suffered for... There's a little verse in Hebrews, I just can't remember the reference, but it speaks about the sacrifice of it, Christ. You know what it says? It says this, he did once. If you could grasp that tonight, that it was one sacrifice for sins forever. The value of the sacrifice was in the value of his life. And he laid it down to God on your behalf. He offered himself to God without spot on the behalf of the lost and the perishing. The cry of Christ, I put him a little bracket beside it. It's a triumphant cry, a triumphant cry. What about the song of the redeemed? I must hurry on. What about the song of the redeemed? Revelation 5, and they sung, this was the people in heaven. And John just got a vision right into heaven and he saw them there gathered around the Lamb of God and there they were, they were singing, thou art worthy, thou art worthy for thou was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. You say, how were they there? How come you told me not that the fighteth shall ever enter in? There'd be no sin in heaven, but everybody all have sinned. How come these men are here? How come these people are here? I but listen to what they're singing. Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. There'll be nobody in heaven. There'll be nobody in, the, in heaven other than through faith and the precious blood of Christ. There'll be nobody in heaven on any merit of the road. There will never be anyone in heaven who'll say, I'm here because I. The only people that'll ever be in heaven, saved and in heaven. I speak reverently. If you were to meet someone in heaven and say, why are you here? They'll say, because Jesus died for me. There'll be nobody there of their own merit. You see, you're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a work of merit. There'll be nobody there and say, well, I'm here because I believe. They'll nobody be there because of, they'll say, well, because I had faith or because I trusted or because I did anything. Listen, it's not of self. If you want to be saved, you'll need to get outside of yourself. Get away from yourself and forget about your own. Forget about yourself. Get your eye fixed on the center cross to the man who cried at us finished. And realize like never before, when Christ died there in the middle cross, he died for me. And the penalty was mine was laid on him. And because he died, I live. That is God's salvation in all its simplicity. And mind you, there's many, including myself, struggled with that. I struggled for years. What did I have to do? Listen, in the words of the hymn writer, all the doing has been done. The work to save is done. We preach Christ and him crucified. We preach a finished work. You say, how do I come into the good of it? Therefore, being justified by faith. It's your faith in a person. It's not actually your faith. It's the faith your person, it's the, it's the person your faith is in. Listen, you get to Christ. Forget about yourself and what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And just get, get to the cross and just see one there taking your place. He bore our sins on his own body on the tree. And it was there at Calvary. He was wounded for our transgressions. Tell me something, if he was wounded for your transgressions, why should you be wounded eternally? Why should you have to bear it eternally? The only reason you'll bear it eternally is because of your sin of rejection. If you get to the cross and get to Christ, and just acknowledge I was a guilty sinner. I am a guilty sinner. But listen, Jesus died who for? For me. That's God's salvation. It's not doing or trying one's best, but simply believing in Jesus, the weary and sinful find rest. I think of the words of the hymn writer. I often quote it. I often enjoy the truth of it. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. And this is it here. For God the just is satisfied to look on him, that's Christ, and pardon me. That's the gospel. He died the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. 
I must hurry on. My time's more than gone. What about Matthew 13? What can I say? So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Just to put that into our everyday language, just sever the, sa the, the unsaved from the saved. Which category are you in now? As you sit under the sound of my voice tonight, which category are you in? Are you unsaved? Or you say, you know, only you know. He shall sever the unsaved from among the saved. And verse 50 is your big problem. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. You're playing hard and fast with the silence of God. But you know there's a day coming and you could add your wail to the dam. You, you, you could add your portion to the wail of the damned. Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. John 3 and 36, the verse through which I was saved. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's the part of the verse I get saved through. I told you it here before. The second half of that verse. He that believeth not, that's you. He that believeth not, that's what I said earlier, the sin of rejection. He that believeth not shall not see life, but lessen the wrath of God. Abideth on him. Are you going to, through your rejection, and for some paltry sin, which is only for a season, the Bible says, are you going to throw your life away and let the Satan and the devil take you and control you. And you'll be severed from the saved. You'll be severed off from the saved on that great day. And the unsaved will be cast into the lake of fire. Mind you, the rich man in Luke 16, that's what happened to him. It says he died and he was buried. If the Lord be not come, that's what will happen to you. You'll die and be, and, and be buried. But I wonder if the, how would it be now? Because the next verse says of him, it says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes. These things are real, you know. These things are real. I don't want to dramatize it. I don't want to play in people's emotions. But I wonder, is it possible tonight that there's somebody under the sound of my voice? And instead of adding your... Instead of helping to swell the song of the redeemed, accept Christ as your Savior. Thank God that he died for you and acknowledge that he died for my sin. I am a guilty sinner, but Jesus died for me. And when time shall be no more, you'll help swell the song of the redeemed. Are you going to go on with your rejection? And add your portion to the will of the damned. You know what I have in the little bracket beside the will of the damned? Unending. That rich man is wailing, weeping and wailing tonight as I speak. And he will never cease to weep and wail. Because the sin of his life in himself he is unable to exhaust the punishment. But before I bring this meeting to an end, I want to take you back to Calvary just for a minute. Just give me a minute. I don't want to leave the meeting there with the wail of the damned. I want to get back to the cross. Get yourself as a guilty sinner to the foot of the cross. I say it again. I've said it a few times. I make no apology for repeating it. And just acknowledge when you see Christ on the cross, I am a guilty sinner. But Jesus died for me. And that's the big part of it, you know. You have to acknowledge you're a sinner. You know, if you realize you're a sinner... Not be too long to you're looking for a saviour. And the words of people who don't want to be saved and people who think they're good enough and people who, who don't want Christ, they'll say to you, I cannot believe that God would send me to hell. Do you see, before, you, before you're saved, you'll do a complete turnaround. That's just repentance, just, just, just a turnaround. You know what the words of your heart will be? I cannot take it in. And God would let me into heaven. Thank God he can. Thank God he will. 
on the foundation, on the basis of the blood of Christ that was shed at Calvary and the death of Christ. That's how God can save yet righteous be. I trust that this will be the night. And you'll not play fast and loose with the silence of God and the grace of God. But you might close in with God's offer of mercy at the cross and realize that when the Savior said to us finished, everything, everything was fully done. And may it be in a day that is yet to be, you'll add your song, you'll help to swell the song of the redeemed. And I trust that it'll never be the portion of any here, that you will add your portion to the will of the damned. Trust Christ tonight, and you'll be saved for eternity. May God bless his word. Our God and our Father, we give thee thanks again for the grace of God. We give thee thanks for the gospel message. We give thee thanks how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We thank thee for the value and worth of the sacrifice of Christ. We thank thee when he died and offered himself to God without spot. It was on the behalf of all. And we thank thee that none need perish. All may live for Christ has died. We pray our Father that thy hand will be heavy upon those in our midst tonight that are not saved. We pray that the Spirit of God might convict of sin and that there might be those, our Father, who would know no peace nor rest until they realize that God, Christ himself, he made peace by the blood of his cross. Help us, O oh God, we pray. Remember these dear souls, they're bound for eternity. May it be, our Father, that there will be none of them end up adding their portion to the will of the damned, but that all might come to the knowledge of the truth. Accept thy Son as Savior and be saved for the never-ending ages to come. We commit this into thy care. We pray for every other gospel meeting, some even yet to be this evening. We commend them one and all to thee and pray our God and our Father that thou wast draw near tonight in salvation and save souls. We give thee thanks for thy Son. We thank thee for the blessings, for thy preserving care another day and commit the evening to thee in the Savior's precious name. Amen.